Tata, from that, anyata, apart, kinchana, something, yet, whatsoever, vivakshata, desiring to describe, pritak, separately. Drisha, vision, tatkrita, reactionary to that, rupa, form, namabi, by names, nakarechit, never, kwapi, any, cha, and, Dushtita mati, med, no, os, oscillating mind. Labeta, gains. Vata ahata, troubled by the wind. No, boat. Eva, like. Aspadam, place. Translation. Whatever you desire to describe that is separate in vision from the Lord simply reacts with different forms, names, and results to agitate the mind as the wind agitates a boat which has no resting place. You can repeat. Whatever you desire to describe that is separate in vision from the Lord simply reacts with different forms, names and results to agitate the mind as the wind agitates a boat which has no resting place. Purport by His Divine Grace, A.C. Bhaktivedanta Swami, Srila Prabhupada. <laughs> Thank you. Srila Vyasa Dev is the editor of all descriptions of the Vedic literatures. And thus, he has described transcendental realization in different ways, namely by fruitive activities, speculative knowledge, mystic power, and devotional service. Besides that, in his various Puranas, he has recommended the worship of so many demigods in different forms and names. The result is that people in general are puzzled how to fix their minds in the service of the Lord. They are always disturbed about finding 
the real path of self-realization. Srila Narada Dev is stressing this particular defect in the Vedic literatures compiled by Vyasa Dev, and thus he is trying to he is trying to emphasize describing everything in relation with the Supreme Lord and no one else. In fact, there is nothing existent except the Lord. The Lord is manifest in different expansions. He is the root of the complete tree. He is the stomach of the complete body. Pouring water on the root is the right process to water the tree as much as feeding the stomach supplies energy to all parts of the body. Therefore, Srila Vyasadeva should have compiled, should not have compiled any Puranas other than the Bhagavat Purana because a slight deviation from that may create havoc for self-realization. If a slight deviation can create such havoc, then what, then what to speak of deliberate expansion of the ideas separate from the absolute truth, personality of Godhead. The most defective part of worshipping demigods is that it creates a definite conception of pantheism, ending disastrously in many religious sects, detrimental to the progress of the principles of the Bhagavatam which alone can give the, ac the accurate direction for self-realization in eternal relation with the personality of Godhead by devotional service in transcendental love. The example of the boat disturbed by whirling wind is suitable in this respect. The diverted mind of the pantheist can never reach the perfection of self-realization due to the disturbed condition of the selection of object. Om Jnana Timarandasya Jnana Shalakaya Chaksurun Militan Yena Tasmai Shri Gurave Namaha Nama Om Vishnu Padaya Krishna Pristaya Bhutale Srimati Bhakti Vedanta Swami Niti Namine Vanchakalpata Rubyascha Kripa Sindhu Bhayevacha Patitanam Pavanebhyo Vaishnavibhyo Namo Namaha Jaya Shri Krishna Chaitanya Prabhu Nityananda Shri Hatvaita Gadhadhar Shri Vasati Gaur Bhaktavinda Hare Krishna Hare Krishna 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 Hare 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 Rama Hare Rama 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 Hare Hare So Narada Muni is counseling Srila Vyasadeva Srila Vyasadeva had of course found himself despondent despite writing so many literatures. Specifically, he, wrote, he had written 18 Puranas, <laughs> six for each of the modes. And he had written Mahabharat, very voluminous text. But it had not brought him the satisfaction which he had expected. And it was at this time Narada Muni came and he is counseling him and telling him what the problem is. And of course the problem is that he had not properly glorified the process of devotional service and he had not properly glorified the worship of the Supreme Personality of Godhead. He had not put the emphasis on devotional service but he'd made it appear very open oh this way that way you know 
people say, oh, it's all the same, it's all one. And you've got people who come up with things like Jatamat, Tatapat, you know, many paths and they're all going to the same goal. So many bogus philosophies have all come up because of this liberal approach. And <laughs> what happened here? Krishna. Hare Krishna. I'm supposed to record this. So, as Prabhupada points out in the purport, Srila Vyasadev had compiled the literatures in such a way that there were many paths to self-realization. But if we study carefully scriptures like Bhagavad Gita and Srimad Bhagavatam, then it's very clear that there's a, one path and that that path is devotion to the Supreme Lord. But if we are thinking the other paths are also okay, then you get problems. In the previous verse, Narada Muni had glorified the process of devotion and words to, which describe the glories of the Supreme Lord. So now in this verse, he's giving the negative aspect of it. What happens when you don't glorify the Lord? What is the result? Just simply a bewilderment of the mind. The mind becomes bewildered. And the example is given about the boat, which has no, it's not moored, it's not tied up. It's just floating in the wind. You know, sometimes the wind goes this way, sometimes goes that way. It's all over the place. So the result is one's own mental activities become like that. The mind wanders from here to that, this one to that one, and we think, oh, I'll do a little bit bhakti, and then we'll do a little bit astanga, and we can do some pranayama, and we can study some jnana, and sankhya also is not so bad, and we're thinking it's all okay, you know, a little bit here, a little bit there. You know, the, the eclectic approach, they call it, right? To be an eclectic. The, you think, oh, it's all good, all, all, all religion is good, you know, and, and they don't actually know anything about God or how to, how to approach the Lord. So therefore Srila Prabhupada said, if Srila Vyasadeva had just simply written the Srimad Bhagavatam, it would have been much better. But instead he had written so many other books, and in these other books he you know, pr promoted different paths. And even worship of the demigods is also there. Just like Jiva Goswami said, nobody ever got love of God from reading Mahabharat. Of course, Mahabharat is important because we have the Bhagavad Gita. But still, the problem, so many people, they get lost in Mahabharata. And what is it preaching about? Different demigod worship, different karmakandi activities, different rituals. Not not emphasizing the process of bhakti. So this is the problem. Okay. Why find not working here so well? So this is the problem that, that people are thinking, it's all good. Prabhupada talks about pantheism. Pantheism, the idea that the world is God. The, the absolute truth becomes the world. And then, of course, Shankaracharya comes along and he says, Jagat Mitya, Brahman Satyam. Right? The world is all false, it's all illusion. And so, people, these different philosophies are taken up by so many people and they're thinking, yeah, very nice. 
everything is illusion, the world is not real, but I'm not real. Only Brahman is truth, ultimately we're all God, so if we're all God we can do whatever we like. There's no need to follow any rules or regulations because we're God. So we can do what we can set our own standards. So this is the problem with these different philosophies, presenting so many different demigods and the idea that the world is God and different processes. But we see how Srila Prabhupada was very focused. As Krishna says, we should be in Bhagavad Gita, Vaya Vasayatmika Bhuti Ekeha Kuru Nandana. That those who are on this path are resolute in determination and their aim is one. The intelligence of those who are irresolute is many branched. So Bahushaka, right? Their, their intelligence is many branched. They're thinking, oh, di different paths, different ways, different goals. So Vyasadeva was at fault that he had opened the door to these other different philosophies. When Srila Prabhupada was translating the Chaitanya Charitamrita, the first part of the Chaitanya Charitamrita to be produced was Adi Lila chapter 7, which is one of the most powerful sections of the Chaitanya Charitamrita where Lord Chaitanya is preaching to Prakashananda Sarasati in Banaras and Prabhupada gives extensive purports there on how Chaitanya Mahaprabhu was preaching Vedanta philosophy to Prakashananda Saraswati because Prakashananda Saraswati was saying you know why don't you study Vedanta like us so Lord Chaitanya then explained to them how his guru, he said, my guru has taught me that I cannot understand Vedanta, I should just chant Hare Krishna. And then he taught him, he said, my guru taught me one verse from the scriptures, Hare Nama, Hare Nama, Hare Nama, Eva Kevalam. Kalo Nasteva, 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 Gatir. That there's no other way, no other way, no other way. Only the holy name. They were, these Mayavadi sannyasis, they were critical of Chaitanya Mahaprabhu that you just go chanting and dancing, this is sentimental. You should sit with us and study Vedanta. But Chaitanya Mahaprabhu told them, no, that the, the, the real understanding of Vedanta is to chant the holy name. That when you actually study Vedanta, you actually realize the conclusions of Vedanta, you have to chant the holy name and take up that work, the chanting of the holy name, the Sankirtan movement. Chaitanya Mahaprabhu therefore did not waste his time with all of these Mayavadi sannyasis. They were only just in, enjoying their mind as described here in this verse, right? It's talking about this dushta, dushtamati the restless mind, like the boat which has no mooring place, just driven by the wind. So our minds are drawn here and there, focused, never focused on any one thing, just restless, looking, trying to find some satisfaction. And ultimately, the, the result is so many people become a victim of the material energy because they have not concentrated on the real process which was devotion to Krishna. They're meant to surrender to Krishna, but instead they try to, in, they become victims of their own mind. And so we have to control the mind, we have to fix the mind on Krishna. Fixing the mind on the Supreme Lord. This is the and Prabhupada writes in the preface of the Nectar of Instruction, in every path of self-realization, control of the mind and senses is essential. So, particularly in our bhakti yoga process, we definitely want to control the mind and senses, and we control the mind by keeping the mind focused in relation to Krishna, activities in relation to the Supreme Lord. 
But Srila Vyasadeva, he had not presented this concept in his Puranas or in his Mahabharat. Some years back I remember the, the Mahabharata, they had, a, they had a dramatical presentation of the Mahabharata. It came to New York and, and people went to see it. But they didn't know anything about Krishna. There was hardly any mention of Krishna in it. It was the Mahabharat. And even the Bhagavad Gita was a very small section of the Mahabharat, the drama. So this, this is the problem with Mahabharata. It doesn't focus on the real goal, which is devotional service. Krishna says in the Bhagavad Gita, only by devotion can I be understood. Only by devotion is Krishna conquered. It's devotion which is the top of the yoga ladder. In so many different verses in the Bhagavad Gita, Krishna is stressing the path of devotion. But Srila Vyasa Dev had taught, he opened the door. He taught so many other processes are also there. You could do this, you could do that. So, this is the, and what is the result? So many different ideas, different concepts, different movements, different spiritual groups. They all have their own philosophies. And they're all thinking, yeah, it's okay. You know, everything's all right. They, they just want to speak about the, the oneness. They don't see the duality. So, Chaitanya Mahaprabhu, his mission, of course, is to deliver us from impersonalism and voidism. In Chaitanya Lila, there's a nice pastime, how Lord Chaitanya, as a young child, was one day given some plate of sweetmeats and some fused rice by Mother Sachi. And Mother Sachi left the child. She thought, my child will eat everything now. He'll be happy to eat. But when she came back, she found Nimai was sitting there eating dirt, putting dirt in his mouth. So Mother Sachi was shocked. And what is this? Why are you putting the dirt in your mouth? And little Nimai said to his mother, he said, why not? What is the harm? This, this sweet which you give me, this rice, this also comes from the earth. I'm eating earth, it's the same thing. This body is earth, ultimately it comes from the earth, we'll go back to the earth. So, I'm eating earth, you give me these sweets, they're also transformation of earth. What's the problem? Mother said she was shocked to hear her child speak this Mayavadi philosophy. Who taught you this nonsense? And Mother Sachi, although she is just an ordinary housewife, but still she could defeat this philosophy of her son. And she explained to her son that when we eat dirt, then our body will become diseased. But when you eat the sweets and the rice, the body will become nourished and healthy and strong. You have to understand the difference. If I take a lump of earth and pour water on it, it's useless. It will just become mud. But when I take the earth in a form of a pot, and pour water into the pot, the water can be stored and can be used later on. So the earth in the form of the pot is practical and performs a function, but the earth in the form of the lump of dirt is useless. And when Nimai heard this, he said to his mother, he said, Oh, Mama, why didn't you tell me this philosophy before? If I had known this, then I would, I would not be eating dirt. So, the Mayavadi philosophy, we have to show how it's not 
practical, how, how it's all so misleading. And Prabhupada here is speaking about the problem that it, the, the worship of so many different demigods, it leads to this pantheistic idea that the world is God. Right? Uh, Shankar Acharya, he promoted this Mayavadi philosophy. Well, even before Shankar Acharya, it was there, but Shankar Acharya promoted it and he gave importance to the Vedic aphorism Sarvam Kalvidam Brahma, that everything is Brahman. Certainly, everything is Brahman. Everything is the Lord. But for Shankaracharya, he claims that there's no energy. The Lord does not have any energy. He claims that the Lord himself becomes transformed into the material world. Our philosophy is Parinam Avada. We say that the Lord has energy, and we define the energies, the Bahiranga, Antiranga, Tatasta Shaktis, the different potencies of the Lord, the living entities, the material world, the spiritual world. These are manifestations of the energy of the Lord. The Lord's energy is transformed. It's not that the Lord is transformed. Shankaracharya he said, Vyasadeva got it wrong. <laughs> what a nerve, huh? Shankaracharya said, Vyasadeva was wrong. Because Vyasadeva says, Janmadhyasya yato navayad. He said, that this world, everything comes from the Lord, from his energies. But Shankaracharya said, no, the Lord himself becomes a world. Everything the Lord transforms into this world and into the living entities. So this is his, his philosophy. That ultimately his idea, we're all God. This is what it comes to. This pantheistic idea. The world is also God. So this creates so many illusions. Their, their philosophy, Shankaracharya's philosophy is called Vivartavada the teaching of illusion. The world is real, it's not false. He claims it's false. He said, Brahman Satyam Jagad Mitya, the world is false. But we cannot agree to that. We say, if I take a brick and hit you over the head, is it false? If I beat you with a broom? If I kick on your head with my shoes, is it false? No, of course, it's not false, it's real. The world is real. It may be temporary, but it is real. We have to understand how to use it. Our philosophy is that what is material can become spiritual by connecting it into the service of the Supreme Lord. We have to know how to dovetail everything in the service of the Supreme Lord. This is the science of Bhakti Yoga. Nirbandha Krishna Sambande Yukta Vairagya Uchate. Using everything in the service of Krishna, that is actual renunciation. It's not necessary that we have to give up everything. And we see also in the Chatur Sloki Bhagavatam, in, in the uh, first can uh, second canto, chapter 9, you have the Chatur Sloki Bhagavatam. So the second of the Chatur Sloki. Rite ritam yad pratiyeta na pratiyeta chatmani. Right? Uh, the Lord is saying, O Brahma, whatever you see to be, whatever you see to be of value in this world, which has no relationship to me, you should know it to be unreal. It's not real. It is simply my illusory potency. Illusion means to take something to be something else. The example is given. 
You think it's a snake, but actually it's a rope. It's a snake. Kill it. It's a snake. No, it's only a rope. This is illusion. The rope is real. The snake, there are also snakes. That rope was not a snake, but there are snakes, and there is also, and that was also, that was a rope. So the illusion is thinking this world is not real. But actually, this world is very real. But it is temporary. And this is the material energy of the Lord. But this material energy can be spiritualized by the process of bhakti yoga, utilizing everything in the service of the Supreme Lord. Just like we give the example, you put the metal bar into the hot fire. The metal bar gradually takes on all the qualities of the fire. It becomes red hot and you take it out of the fire, it can burn just like the fire. So it becomes like the fire. The same way, living entities, we come into this material world, and we are in contact with the material energy, our spiritual nature is covered. But when we contact the devotees of the Lord, and they give us the process of devotional service, they plant the, the seed of devotion in our heart, then we can spiritualize our body, our mind and senses. They become purified by utilizing them in the service of the Supreme Lord. One who uses the body, mind and words in the service of the Supreme Lord he is a liberated soul, even in this world. Jivan Mukta, he becomes a liberated soul. Although we're living in this world, we have a material body, we become liberated when we use the body, mind and words in the proper manner for the pleasure of the Supreme Lord. So this, of course, is what Srila Vyasadev should have been emphasizing when he was writing his scriptures when he was presenting. But it was not until after getting the instructions from Narada Muni that he actually understood what he'd done wrong. So therefore the Srimad Bhagavatam was his mature realization of all of his knowledge, all of the Vedic knowledge. Therefore we say Nigama Kalpa Taror Galitam Palam this Srimad Bhagavatam, this is the, the ripened fruit of all of the Vedas. The Vedic knowledge is like the tree. What good is a tree without a fruit? Just like you may have a big mango tree, but at this time of the year there are no mangoes. Nobody cares. But when the mangoes come out, where are the fruit? The fruit is a valuable thing from the tree. So the, the Vedas are the tree and the fruit of the tree is this Srimad Bhagavatam. And this Srimad Bhagavatam, Shukamukha Damrita Drava Samyatam. It's all the more sweeter because it's coming from the mouth of Shukadeva Goswami. The parrot always knows the sweet fruit. If you find the mango fruit which has been pecked by the parrot, you know, that must have been a good mango. The parrot got it. Right? But those things which have no relationship to Krishna, that, that was described earlier. Tadvag visargo janataga viplavo yasmin priti slokam badiyavachapi. Oh, no, the other verse. A place of pilgrimage for the crows. Prabhupada or Srimad Bhagavatam tells us, Srila Vyasadeva said, 
Tadvayasam Tirta Mushanti Manasa Nishanti Ushikshaya, right? Srila uh, Vyasa Dev describes those literatures which do not describe the glories of the Lord, then they're like a place of pilgrimage for the crows. But those literatures which are full of the glories of the Lord, they're a different creation. And they can bring about a revolution in the impious lives of the world's misdirected civilization. Such literature, heard, sung, although imperfectly composed, are heard, sung, and accepted by such people who are thoroughly honest. So, two very powerful verses which Prabhupada puts in his preface to Srimad Bhagavatam, very, very important verses, which are here just a few verses earlier in this chapter, describing the contrast between topics of Krishna and everything not in relation to Krishna. If it's not in relation to Krishna, it's just like the place of pilgrimage of the crows. You go to Calcutta, you see the crows. Where? In the garbage, right? Or there's a dead rat. There's a dead rat. The crows all come. They have a feast. They eat the dead rat. Like that. Place of pilgrimage for the crows. So there's no real pleasure there, but the there's the illusion, people are thinking, they're getting some pleasure, they're getting some satisfaction from it. Simply, it's the bewilderment of the mind. Their mind, the, that mind which is moving restlessly, like the boat without a, wrestling, a resting place. But when we actually come to Krishna consciousness and we begin reading the books about Krishna and hearing the glories of the Lord and his pastimes and all his qualities and activities, then we find satisfaction. There's nothing more to be read. You can read Srimad Bhagavatam again and again. Chaitanya Charitamrita is there. We can read it again and again and so many other wonderful books the Goswamis have given us like Brihad Bhagavatam Rita and so many other Lagu Bhagavatam Rita and Hari Bhakti Vilat there's so many wonderful literatures for the devotees to hear and to relish we don't need to go to that place of pilgrimage for the crows so Narada Muni is pointing out the contrast between these two different types of literature. He wants, he wants Vyasadeva to correct something, to do something about this and to properly glorify the process of Bhakti Yoga. And the result is we get this Srimad Bhagavatam. This is all being described here in the first canto because uh, the sages wanted to know how did this literature come about? How, how did it happen that th this literature came about? So Srila Vyasadeva describes what was the cause, what brought about him writing and presenting this Srimad Bhagavatam. Okay, any questions, comments? Yes, Prabhu. said that Devi is the cause of creation and also in, uh, in Shiv Purana, if we read Shiv Puran, in Shiv Purana it said that uh, Shiva is the one who is giving Sudarshan Chakra to Krishna. So how to understand, I mean uh, absolute truth is only one, so how can the creation will be different in every Purana? And Vyasdeva is Supreme Personality of God in Himself, so how He can, uh, I mean it, it's all contradictory, so how to understand that Maharaj? Mm. Prabhu, Prabhu is putting the question, he said, the process of creation appears to be differently described in different Puranas. 
For example, he said in Shiva Purana is described Shiva as the cause of creation. And so he said how to resolve these different contradictions for people. So according people who are reading like Shiva Purana, their understanding is according to Lord Shiva. So Srila Vyasadeva has to accommodate their thinking. He has to present that Shiva is the creator, that Shiva is doing it. But who is giving the power to Shiva to do the creation? Of course, Shiva plays a role in the creation. He does play a role in the creation. But, you know, he's assisting in, the, in that creation. And who is Shiva? Shiva is also the expansion of the Lord, right? Vishnu transforms into Shiva. So, it has to be understood properly these people who are reading Shiva Purana, they can only understand Shiva. If he was to tell them Vishnu did it, they could never, under, they could never accept beyond their understanding. So the teacher presents according to the ability of the audience to understand. So people are reading Puranas which are for the people in the mode of ignorance, so they present that kind of knowledge which is suitable for people in that mode of ignorance, as much as they can accept. And gradually, if they, if they understand that much, gradually they'll go on to understand higher philosophy. But so long as they're still embedded in the mode of ignorance, they can only understand things which are presented in the mode of ignorance. They cannot understand anything higher. They have their particular way of thinking. And so it's presented like that for them, for their understanding just to get them to accept that there is a creation, there is a creator, and it's good. So they understand Shiva, they think Shiva is doing the creation. But later on they'll go on to understand that Shiva gets his power to, for creation from Vishnu. And who is Shiva? That Shiva is the transformation of Vishnu. So gradually it will all fit together. Just take some further meditation and realization, gradually they go on, we cultivate, you know, we understand we're in the mode of ignorance, we understand there's something higher. We should, maybe we should come a bit higher, get out of the mode of ignorance, come to the higher platform. What do we need to do to come to the higher platform? You know, then come up to try to come up to the mode of goodness. Then from the mode of goodness, you know, once you get to the mode of you want to go higher, you want to become fixed in the mode of goodness. Shuddha sattva. So, so like that, people have to understand the process gradually. Yes? Maharaj, uh, so, um, I mean, in it's, then Devi Puran also it's written that Devi is the creator, I mean, cause of creation. Devi, Devi Puran, Devi Bhagavat, if we read, in that also it's written, Devi is the cause of creation. So we say that uh, Vyasdeva is Supreme Personality of Godhead. So how can he write so many uh, different, different things? So, I mean, it, it, will, I mean, it will create a wrong... Uh, well, this is, why, this is why he wrote Srimad Bhagavatam. This is what Prabhupada is making the point in the purport here that he should have only written the Srimad Bhagavatam. He shouldn't have written all of these other things. If he'd only written the Srimad Bhagavatam, we wouldn't have all this problem. But because he wrote all these other books, you've got all these other different people, different philosophies. But it's very clear. Only by devotion can I be understood, Krishna said, right? And Lord Chaitanya said, no other way, no other way. Lord Chaitanya is saying only one way, and Prabhupada is saying only one way. <laughs> we just have to follow. But you, you go to the Devi Purana, yeah, you get bewildered. If you go to all these other different books, different, you know, different things, different philosophies. So therefore Prabhupada warned us, be very careful. Don't go here and there. Just stay here. Yes. Any other question, comment? One last question, Maharaj. Yes. Uh, 
uh, Maharaj, and how to understand that in uh, various, I mean, even in uh, Bhagavatam also, we say that Krishna is getting Sudarshan from someone. And also in uh, Shiva Puran, it's written that Shiva is the one who is giving Sudarshan Chakra to Krishna. So, how to understand this? That uh, Because the, uh, the followers of Shiva, they will say that Shiva has given Sudarshan Chakra to Krishna. So, different places, Krishna is taking Sudarshan Chakra from different people. So, how to understand that? How to understand that in some places it said Shiva gives power to Krishna. Yeah, I was distributing books. I remember years ago I was in the, the BBT library party and we were traveling in South India and we were going to temples and we would distribute Prabhupada's books there because the temples had a library and we would show them the Chaitanya Charitamrita and we'd say, your temple is in this book. And you would, you know, we'd show them a picture, maybe a picture of their temple was there or something. And we'd tell them like that and we'd show them the book. And the, the, you know, they would like it. They'd buy the books because their temple was, a picture of their temple was in the book. So I remember one time, this one, one um, Brahmana, he got the book and he saw the picture, you know, Shiva sitting below the tree and above the, in the top of the tree is Lord Krishna. And it shows that Shiva's meditating on Krishna. And he said to me, he said, the picture is the wrong way around. He said, it should be, <laughs> it should be Krishna meditating on Shiva. <laughs> you know? <laughs> so, how, how to understand these things? They meditate on each other. Krishna, you know, Lord Rama worships Lord Shiva, right? That's well known. Lord Rama worshipped Lord Shiva. Show the example for people. Because Shiva is God of the material world. He's the God of the material world. So people, ordinary, for, for ordinary people, they worship Lord Shiva. They cannot understand the divinity, the, the special nature of Lord Krishna. Lord Krishna is <laughs> very mysterious sometimes, very puzzling to understand his pastimes, more difficult. But at the same time, in Bhagavad Gita, Lord Krishna himself says, Raja Vinja Raja Guyam Pavitram Idamutamam Prakyak Shvavagabam Dharmyam Susukam Kartam Avyayam Right? It, 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 it joyfully performed. Krishna consciousness is very joyful, it's everlasting, joyfully performed. It's confidential though. Not everybody is immediately able to understand Lord Krishna and his pastimes and Leela. It's for special fortunate souls. Fortunate souls get the opportunity. But if they're worshipping Lord Shiva, uh, Prabhupada said it's better than people who are not on the Vedic path at all. At least they're on the Vedic path. And from the worship of the demigods, they will come gradually to understand the Supreme Lord. Because the worship of the demigods can only give something which is temporary. And they should want to get something which is eternal. So as they become more purified, they will take up the higher process. They will come to Krishna consciousness. Okay. Thank you very much. Srimad Bhagavatam Ki Chai. You had a question, Prabhu? Hare Krishna. Prabhu is asking, what is the position of Padma Purana and Vishnu Purana? Because these Puranas were already, basically, we have already wrote them together with 18 Puranas and many times Prabhupada quotes them because they talk about Bhakti. So what is the position of these Puranas? And so, Padma Purana, Vishnu Purana, they're in the mode of goodness. They're for people in the mode of goodness. Srimad Bhagavatam is for the transcendentalists. But Padma Purana, Vishnu Purana quoted, 
because they are meant for people in the mode of goodness. Prabhu is adding that this verse Smarta Vyam Satata Vishnu is describes the uh, principles of bhakti, pure bhakti. What? This verse that you always must remember the Lord and yeah. never forget. So this verse is from Vishnu Purana. Is from Padma Purana, and this describes the pure bhakti. Uh -huh. Does it mean that these um, scriptures they represent the pure bhakti and they are transcendental, or they just pure um, satvaguna? Well. Being in the mode of goodness is certainly conducive to pure goodness, much easier, very closely connected. So Prabhupada would often quote, we see Prabhupada gives evidence from these scriptures because they're related to the mode of goodness. As devotees we cultivate the mode of goodness, certainly Krishna consciousness is for facilitating the mode of goodness. Prabhupada emphasizes that in the Bhagavad Gita, many places, many purports. So, yeah, no contradiction. Certainly an important verse. Always remember Krishna, never forget him. So sometimes Prabhupada would give evidence from these Puranas. Just to, but the idea is to support what's already here in Srimad Bhagavatam. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. Hare Krishna. Srila Prabhupada Ki Jai.